Good evening and welcome to Tag Magazines and Scene Live. We are back this year for another great season and I am super excited about today's show and today's guest. Uh, and if you all are tuning in, which I see that you are, then you two are just as excited as I am. Uh, so for those who don't know Tag Magazine, we are a bi-monthly print publication and website for everything lesbian, queer, and under the rainbow. And last year, we started and seen live where we've had amazing guests like Rosie O'Donnell, uh, Dominique Jackson from Pose, uh, actress Kat Burrell, the list goes on. Uh, and this season is no different. I feel like we have the perfect guest to kick off uh, the season and Pride Month because it's still, it's still Pride. Uh, so as you all are coming in, you guys are tuning in, uh, don't forget this is live. Uh, so if you are gonna have questions for our next guest, uh, make sure that you do that in the comments. Uh, and I will try to get to as many comments and questions as I possibly can. But you are not here for me. You are here for the one only Leah Delaria. She is a comedian, actress, jazz singer, and producer of executive producer of the Lesbian Bar Project film. And many of you know her as Big Boo on Orange is the New Black. But before then, she was making history, being the first openly gay comic on television here in the United States. In the United States, which led to countless television and film roles, portraying police lieutenants, PE teachers, and of course, the lesbians who inappropriately hit on straight women. We've all seen that, right? Uh, and I can't wait to talk to her about the Lesbian Bar Project. Uh, I don't know if any of you know, but she has a business in P-Town, so please stick around to hear a little bit about that. Uh, and of course, I wanna talk to her about everything butch as well. Anyway, there's a lot to talk about. So why don't I just bring out the one, the only Leah Delaria. How are you, my friend? That was an interesting introduction there, Ebony. Was it? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'll take it. <laughs> so is it Ebony or Ebony? Oh, that is a great question. It is Ebony. Um, yes. ev everyone... I saw the little French thing. Yes. Everybody calls me Ebony. what that's called. Um, an accent. That's what I say. They call it an accent, but it actually has... <laughs> It actually has a, for anybody listening, I know it has an actual French name. Just, you know, shout that out to us if you would. It does have a French name. Um, and yeah. I will go crazy. I will go crazy trying to think of it. That's, you know, <laughs> Please. That's insane Gemini personality. We're going to be having this conversation. And then the others, this side of my brain is going to be going, what the fuck? What is that called? And what's so sad? And I should know it. I should absolutely know I, that. But there's nothing French. You're the one fucking using it, not me. <laughs> Well, I'm going to blame my mom. I'm going to tell her I'm going to blame my mom on that one for yeah. sure. Uh, Cause she wanted to be all fancy. There's nothing French about us that I, that I know. <laughs> but I just want to thank you so much uh, for, for being our first guest uh, for on season two. Really appreciate you. Happy to be here. Thrilled to be here. Yeah. So there is a lot to talk about. Uh, and of course, I've encouraged people to um, write in their questions. So we'll get to those shortly. Uh, but let's talk about, I mean, I was going to say what what's new, but before you <laughs> we got on here, you have been doing so much. So let's talk about what is um, semi-new-ish, which is the Lesbian Bar Project, the right. short film that you are the executive producer on. Um, if no one has seen that, please take the time to Google Lesbian Bar Project. They also have a website, but I'll let uh, Leah take a, talk a little bit more about it. Um, why the Lesbian Bar Project? What made well, you? You know, I've been I've been for years um, bringing up and talking in podcasts, on television shows, in interviews. I mean, I've been speaking about this for quite a long time. Uh, that the lesbian bars in America appear to be disappearing. Um, I'm finding that not so much in other places in the world, like, like for example, London has two lesbian bars. Uh, you know, I, and um, 
it seems to be indicative of Amer of North America. In South America, there's in, in Central America, there still seems to be lesbian bars. I don't know um, why this was happening. I have I, I have ideas, and I have discussed them many times, and we talk about it in the documentary itself, and so on and so forth. Um, but we have been disappearing. The dyke bars are disappearing, and I think most of the people that were listen that are listening to this podcast probably already know why. It's a social economic situation. Uh, women make less money than men. Two women together make way less money than two men together. This is why you can go to a city and there'll be your choice of 10 to 20 different gay bars, but you're lucky if there's one lesbian bar. Um, and then we, when we thought lesbian bars that we did have, which our research showed us there was over 200 in, in the 1980s here in America, um, those bars gradually started to disappear, not just because of the social economic reasons that we've already discussed. You know, women can only really afford to go out one night a week. You know what I mean? Like that. Yeah. Yep. But also because of gentrification, mm. because the places where these bars were, were always the cheapest places. Right. Were, we were in the ghetto, <laughs> but those, the ghettos have all pretty much been gentrified in America. And so what happens is the rent for these places have skyrocketed again. You can't keep a place open if it's only crowded on Friday and Saturday night. You know what I mean? The rest, you, you need to be able to pay your bills for the rest of the week as well. Wow. So the rent prices go up. Uh, the business the business wasn't there add to that the fact that societal perception of queers have changed we don't necessarily have to just go to a gay bar we can go to any bar you know we've 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 won in terms of opening the hearts and minds of people to who that gay people are human and we and we have a right to exist you know right that's about as far as we've gotten we got a lot more to do but you know so they they can go they can go anywhere and drink and then also there's this per, this queer perception um where a lot of the young dykes don't want to party with just dykes they're like why do i want to just be in a lesbian bar when i can be like get with everybody in the community and of course my response to that is that sounds really really internalized homophobic to me that sounds mm. like you've heard some shitty things about dyke bars and you yeah. have preconceived notions about dyke bars and you're not going to them because dyke bars are all inclusive and and have been for a really fucking long time you know what i mean yep dyke bars have been more inclusive were more inclusive than any other bar in the, in the queer spectrum way before everybody else was you know what i mean so the, all those things combined and the bars are disappearing so um you know, as I said, I've been talking about it for a long time. Well, Elena and Erica uh, basically got together the idea of doing the Lesbian Bar Project, and they came to me because they knew I'd been talking about it. Um, and of all the uh, the celesbians, if you want to say, yeah. uh, I, which I never call, I'm more of a dicon. Ooh, <laughs> a I like that word. <laughs> but. Uh, of all the lesbians that are out there, I really am the person, I have the brand that fits in with the dyke bar, you know, idea. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I've always been sort of the, how should we put it? The bad, the bad boy of lesbian comedy. And the, you know, like, you know what I mean? Uh, the idea of being politically correct and following a concept of political correctness has uh, is something I have fought against my entire career as an openly dyke comic. Um, so it seemed like the right fit to reach out to me, and they did. And I've been on board ever since because I think safe spaces for queer women are important, mm. very important. And as they disappear, some of these younger dykes who don't understand the history and how hard we fought to be able to have this place to go to, you know, as they disappear. And when they find that they aren't there anymore, they're going to miss them. They're going to, they're going to see how difficult it is without a safe space for queer women. We need oh, that space. Hands down. There's nothing like a queer women's space. Agreed. Agreed. Um, there, it, it, it's just nothing like it. And it's so important. And I'd, I'd hate to see them die out. Uh, and 
ex- miss that experience. I can't even imagine New York City without the cubby hole. Yep. You know what I mean? Or Absolutely. the Hudson's. Or yeah. Hudson's. Absolutely. Brooklyn. I can't imagine it. I now have to live San Francisco without the Club Lex. And that's mm-hmm. a, I, you know, I, 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 I've been to San Francisco, I guess, maybe four times since the Lexington Club closed. And it's horrifying. You know, it's just bad. Yeah. It was always my, I always was going to go, I do what, whatever my job was, whether I'm filming or I'm the Grand Marshal of the Gay Pride Parade or, you know, whatever. I always know that I'm going to end my night at the Club Lex when I go to San Francisco. It closed. It closed for all the reasons we are stating here. The, yep. rent sky- and the rent skyrocketed and that was the end of the Club Lex. And that was an institution in San Francisco for a very long time. You know, yeah. and the same the same thing with the flame in San Diego and all these different bars that I can name that have just gone. See ya. They're just gone. Yeah, it's it's crazy. So um, like I told you before, I'm here in Washington, D.C., and uh, we had the longest running lesbian bar for a while. Phase phase one here in D.C. And I, I feel like everything you described uh, as far as uh, gentrification and obviously, you know, economic status, things like that. I think a lot of everything you describe is a big. Have a fight with Wild Women West in San Francisco about the longest-running lesbian bar. Well, they were. That's why I said they were. Forty, uh, forty years in. When did they open? I think it was forty years in 2015. So what is that math here? Uh, pool. What is that? Would that 19, would that be like 1975-ish? Yeah, Something. Too, yeah, 1975. Yeah. They I were, they were. That, They're I not anymore. They were. I, yeah. But but I think what I'm saying is Women Wild West, I believe, opened in Bernal Heights in San Francisco in the early 70s as well. See, this is the, this is part of it. This has been, to me, part of the problem. Yeah. We don't. We all need to communicate more. Do you know what I mean? Do we, do? We, all like, we all now that we have the internet, like back in those days, I get it. They probably didn't know that Women Wild West was open in San Francisco, right? And over that, like that. But now, now I think, uh, and what one of the things the Lesbian Bar Project is doing, it is networking between these dive bars. Like they're all coming together and getting to know each other and support each other. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And becoming a real community of dive bar owners. You and know, we I, need that. I think it'd be really fun to, to do something. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm spitballing right now, but it'd be really fun to do something where we have like the whole dive community, you know, start like we give out an award every year, vote on what's the best dive bar in America. What's, you know, all that kind of stuff. It would be really fun and do it, do the event at every dive bar in America. And it would just change every year. It would take Listen, 21 years to get it to, to go the full circle. But I'm down. Fun. Listen, everybody heard it here first. Okay. Ebony Wouldn't Bell in the Wouldn't it be fun? It'd be so fun. It would be a lot of fun. I mean, I don't think that's a bad idea at all. <laughs> I'm going to be, um, you know, I'm going to be following up with you now, right? Yeah, baby. All right. Just, just making sure. Just making I'm sure. Uh, work with another butch on anything. Hey, I love it. Yes. And uh, but I want to get to that word for sure. But I want to know about what was your first lesbian bar experience? Where did you go? Well, I grew up in a little town called Belleville, Illinois. Okay. Um, which is a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. I was okay. on the Illinois side of the river from St. Louis. And between Belleville and St. Louis is a town called East St. Louis. Uh, a lot, of, Many, many people know it because that's where Flo Joe is from and Miles Davis is from, right? Um, East St. Louis is essentially a, a huge black ghetto that sprung up around St. Louis and the work that was in St. Louis mm-hmm. as African-Americans migrated from the South to parts of the North for work. Right. So um, in East St. East St. Louis was a four o'clock town, like everything stayed up until four o'clock, whereas St. Louis closes at two. Belleville, where I live, if they made it to 11, we were lucky. You know, it was a tiny little town. 
So um, there were there was a little hub right on the edge of East St. Louis uh, under the bridge uh, where there were several gay bars. Well, most notably was a place called Faces, which was a huge dance club, blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. around it. Right around the corner from Famous Faces was this tiny little dyke bar called the Red Bull. The Red and, Bull. Uh, yeah, the Red Bull. So when I was 16 in Illinois, you could enter a bar at the age of 18. You could drink beer and wine. All you needed was, you know, a driver's license that said you were 18. So I had a fake license when I was 16 that said that I was 18, um, which wasn't that far of a stretch. And also remember back then, you didn't, we didn't have pictures on our driver's license. We just had information. So if your, your height matched, your hair matched, your eye color matched. Like you that, were in. You, you were basically in. If they were concerned, they might ask you a question about it. So all you had to do is memorize the card. So um, I had heard about this place when I was in high school from, you know, rumblings from other students, blah, 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 blah. And uh, so I decided, what the fuck? It was just off of Main Street. I had a, there was a bus that went from my town into that town that ran late into the night. So I, you know, one Friday night, I just get, climbed out the back window of my <laughs> parents' house, and we had a we had these aluminum poles that held up the aluminum roof that was like a, you know, shade over our patio. Or so. So I, you know, walked out and shinned down the pole. And trust me, I wasn't the only child to do that in my family. We all, we all escaped occasionally in the middle of the night. And I went to that dike bar, and that was my first dike bar. And I went again and again and again. I can tell you, and That's I went amazing. there a whole lot when I, especially once I turned twenty and twenty-one. So I was at the Red Bull. I was at Faces. I was at all the bars. There was a place called Middle of the Road uh, that was a lesbian bar that um, started out. And this is back when they would actually segregate. Like there would be black dyke bars and white dyke bars hmm. you know, and Hispanic dyke bars. And yeah, so Middle of the Road was where the more uh, white was white dyke bar. It, and the woman who owned it sold it to a, a black dyke who opened up a black, turned it into a, like a black dyke bar. But that was the first time I saw a bar in my my area integrate because a lot of us just like middle of the road and we just stayed there. So yeah. That was, yeah, that was like this great experience. Now, I would go to places in the South at that time and everybody was partying together. You didn't have, there wasn't enough money to segregate. You right, know what I mean? right. And camaraderie would, would happen. I mean, we're talking about a historical perspective of America, it's so different now. You know what I mean? But back then, segregation was a real, a real thing, a ridiculous real thing. And it did put its, rear its ugly head within our queer community. Yeah, it's, uh, I've talked to people about this before, how, um, you know, it, it, when people would come here to DC, for example, they'd be like, wow, you guys have this type of bar and this type of bar and this type of bar where I'm from, everybody just comes in and because party. I think some of it's a resources thing. It's like, hey, we don't have time to be separated. We only have X amount of money or X amount of space here. So we're all just going to get together, you know? Exactly. And that's, I find that, and I found that when I started performing in the early 80s, I found that most, is, especially in the South, when I would go to places to perform in the South, it was all... Men, women, you know, men, women, trans, black, white, Asian, brown, everybody partying together because this was the bar. Yeah. And I would go in and perform. And I always loved that, by the way. That always made me, you know, really happy. San Francisco, same thing. Very rarely, like I, I, came, I came out as a, a performer in San Francisco. In the city of San Francisco, even though, I mean, there was a million places to go to. Everybody partied together. There was no, none of this, there was no restriction as it were. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, people have and, noticed. And all of it, everybody together. Nobody said, you can't come in here. You're, you're a woman. You can't come in this gay bar. Nobody ever said that. Right. We weren't yeah. any bags in our dyke bar. Nobody ever said that. Yeah. No, 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 the black bar is down the road. Nobody ever said that in San Francisco, ever. Yeah. So it was one of the I reasons I loved being there. 
Yeah, I have to. And I also have to just say that people have taken notice of the uh, your name. <laughs> I think somebody thought it was it was wrong that we did something wrong, but no, it's it's it's. No, 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 no. I did it. Everybody, <laughs> calm down. I thought it was funny. I did it. I thought it was Instead funny. Being an asshole as usual. <laughs> oh my god! Well, people are noticing, so I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you a couple other questions, and then uh, I want to get to uh, some. Uh, some fan questions. So please, Wait, if you I have, I just say, I'm so happy I'm talking to a butch. Oh, oh I <laughs> when I do this shit, I swear to God, it's always femmes. Not and honey, you know I love me a film. <laughs> no, me yes. too. But I'm just really excited to have this shared experience with that. With you know, you know what I mean? we do have a shared experience. We do, and let's yeah. talk about that because I want to talk a little bit about representation because you are a pioneer for exactly that. Um, maybe you don't call yourself that, but I, I will call you that if nobody ever has. You are. Uh, or a daikon, as, as you said. That's me being um, funny again. <laughs> something that I've noticed um, more recently is, one, we're starting to see more butch slash uh, maybe even androgynous, uh, masculine and center women uh, in roles in TV, entertainment, media, all of that. Um, but one thing I also am noticing is you're not seeing a lot of black butch women still. Um, and I feel like there's still work. There I'm is. not saying there's none. Absolutely. I'm not saying there's none. No, no, absolutely. I'm trying to think of that one show and I, it, God damn it. I can't remember the name of it. It's Hispanic though. It's Latinx. And there's a, a, a basically me only Latinx. Butch, right. Right. <laughs> And I, this is terrible that I can't remember the name of it. Um, it's because I actually don't have the channel that it's on, but I was really excited to read about it. And when I read about it, that was the thing where I went, after Samira, has there ever been any kind of masculine of center? And by Samira, I mean Samira Wiley, of course, on Orange. Right. Has there been? I don't think so. In media, can you name anybody? because I can't. And if anybody out there can, shout it out to me. Yeah, uh, Jennifer who is watching said Vita. Is the show Vita you're Vita, talking about? that's the show. I was like, Vita, is it Vita Loca? Vita? Like that, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks Jennifer. Jennifer. Vita is the show. And there's a really like great, um, you know, Latinx butch on that show. Oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Also, and, but you also have to say Asian butch representation. This, I should have said black and brown, people of color. I should have just said people just of color. Just say POC and get it <laughs> Just over. people of color in general. I'm not seeing a lot of that. But let's also well, be real. And also, Even, Sada Ramirez is also what I would call a gender nonconforming. And, um, you know, definitely masculine center in the way that she presents herself. And she's had a ton of work. You know, she was on Madam Secretary in that, in that tie, wearing a suit yep. and a tie. You know what I mean? Yep. yep. So... She's she's had a lot of work. I have um um I have great hope for the reboot of Sex in the City. I think we're going to see a lot of that. You think so? Well, yeah. well, let's talk about let's talk about your experience because it had we had to start somewhere, right? Sure. Uh, to start seeing women who look like us. Um, and um, tell me about your I guess your experience with that. You you were one of the people that jump started to say, hey, we exist. Yeah, I was constantly screaming, hello, we exist. I mean, I've been doing that since I'm, you mentioned I was the first openly gay comic on television in America. That's a fact. That was 1993 on the Arsenio Hall show. Um, and from that point forward, the thing about me playing PE teachers and police lieutenants, they're absolutely true. And the lesbian who inappropriately hits a straight woman at every function, oh. absolutely true. That's kind of the thing that I was relegated in. Um, also, that was at the time of lesbian chic. Blech. And um, <laughs> for those of you that don't understand what lesbian chic is, Google it if you're young and you don't get it. But I can just basically give you the like a two sentence description. Lesbian chic is when it became really hip um, in Hollywood media, um, pop culture to um, access lesbianism, except they weren't really accessing lesbianism. 
Uh, they were accessing that male fantasy of jerking off to two women doing it. Mm -hmm. That's what yep. it was all about. Yep. So when they made movies like, for example, Bound is the first one that I can think of, right? That came out of Lesbian Sheep. So yeah, it was written about a, a lesbian couple, but it was written by two men. It was directed by a man and the lesbian couple were two straight women. So we were completely erased from the narrative. Um, yep. They asked me to do a bit part in that movie and I said no which happened to me a lot. I, I, I did it a couple of times before I realized what was going on. They were using me to legitimize their bullshit. And when I realized that I didn't want to, didn't want to be used that way anymore, I wanted to be the person speaking out against it, which mm. is what I started doing. So um, we were completely erased from our own narrative and the world started to view us. And this happened in the L word as well. And a couple of other things that I can think of, um, they saw us as how we, how straight men wanted to see us. And that's how, that's how they saw us as a mere sexual fantasy, you know, and they didn't see us as real living people. Now the backlash of lesbian chic gave us things like watermelon woman, which is a fantastic movie that came out in the 1990s yes. in case no one's ever seen it. One um, and Go Fish, another fantastic movie that came mm -hmm. out in the 1990s that, you know, nobody ever, that, that like people may not know, but they should see. Um, what makes those movies stand out to me more than, let me think of some other movies at that. Well, well, we'll go to Bound again. Let's just say Bound again. But there were some other movies at the time. Those movies were written by lesbians, directed by lesbians, and lesbians portrayed lesbians in those movies. So those were movies that really told our story. Um, so now we find ourselves, and you know, and I've watched the pendulum swing back and forth between lesbian representation and queer representation and no representation. I've watched it go back and forth my whole career. What, or, so we went into a place where gay men were really hot. Will and Grace uh, gave us that. Uh, RuPaul gave us that. I mean, it was like gay, really hot. We weren't seeing much lesbian representation. And if we did see it, once again, written by men, directed by men, portrayed by straight women, that's all it ever was. Enter Orange is the New Black. Orange is the New Black had lesbians in the writer's room, lesbian directors, and fucking dykes playing fucking dykes. Uh, it was a, like a miracle to me. I didn't think it would ever happen. So that really changed the face of television. And not just for dykes, for women. You know, Correct. It had every shape and size of woman that you could imagine in that show. You know what I mean? And the, the patriarchal concept of beauty went right the fuck out the window, mm. which I loved. You know what I mean? Yes. It's okay. like, what, oh my God. When I look at some of those girls like Selenus and, and Danny Brooks and, you know, these people that I think are stunningly beautiful women that society ignores because of their color, because their butt is big, because like, by the way, what's wrong with a big butt? And you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, and, you know, what society would, would probably focus on would be, you know, Preeps and, and Taylor, you know, and, and, uh, and a lot of dykes did it too. But the reality is the show itself just went, you know, bang. And it changed, it changed the societal perceptions mm. of beauty and normalcy. You know, when we see, when we see Laverne Cox portraying what it's like to be a trans woman in prison. And by the way, 100%, what it was like to be a trans woman, what it is like to be a trans woman in prison, 100% the show hit it nail on the head. Um, we see, we see the dialogue being changed. We see the narration being changed. And we, mm -hmm. and then crash bang, boom. We see these butches coming out on different shows and lesbians again, being portrayed by lesbians and directed by lesbians. That's a big fucking deal, right? Yeah. But now that pendulum is starting to swing back and has been for a few years. We're still represented, but you're not seeing that butch representation as much anymore. It's the pretty girls again. And a lot of the roles are being portrayed by straight women. I would say 90%. Um, and I, no more, no more lesbians in the writer's room, not seeing any dykes in the writer's room, not seeing dykes directing. So we're back into that place. 
And what really pisses me off about it, I mean, as long as we're talking here. Yay. As long as we're talking. <laughs> what really pisses me off about it is that within our own rainbow lettered community, if a trans, if a trans role is written by a non-trans person and then acted by a non-trans person, our community goes crazy. They get up and they fucking bitch and shout. Same thing if it's a gay person. They never back the dyke. Huh. They never back the L. When have you ever heard anybody say, what do you mean you're going to cast a straight woman in a lesbian role? Have you, you ever heard that? Have you, you ever heard have me go crazy over that? You have literally just blown my mind right now. Never, never heard it in my life. You're absolutely right. We're all standing online to support the L word. All of us. And there's only, I think only two of the characters are actual lesbians. Maybe it's three. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's two. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's two or three, if that. No, we wow. got a word to say about it. That is I interesting. Know. I've always had words to say about it. I've had words to say about it since moment one. You know. You have. You have your next assignment with Tag Magazine. There you go. <laughs> I'm, oh, there I'm you go. Write about I'm that. I'm in. I'll write that op-ed, honey. I. They that is so me, Leah, why don't you shut up? Because if you, you know, you're never going to be able to play a straight woman. They won't let me play a straight woman. Who, who says you can't they play one? <laughs> I became a famous actor playing a straight woman. Like people knew I could act because I was Hildy and on the town that, you know, I won a million acting awards for. I became a famous actor by playing a straight girl that had to get laid yesterday, but they won't let me play a straight girl now. And mm. they won't let me play lesbians because they're too busy casting straight women. Right. So, yeah. I got, wow. I got issues. Listen, I, you have literally just like blown my mind. I'm, as you're saying it, I'm like, wow, I've never heard anybody say, oh, wait, why are you guys? I'm saying it. Women do this it's, or, the, it's the same reason young lesbians don't go into lesbian. But look, the L in the LG, LGBTQAI community and plus, we have been second class citizens within our own community for so very long. And I've been fighting this my whole life, you know? I mean, it's one of the reasons why I don't use the alphabet. It's why I say queer. It's an, uh, it's an, an mm. umbrella that encompasses all of us. Yep. I think if you say the LGBTQAI plus community, you're actually focusing on our differences rather than our shared oppression. Mm. And it's one of the things that makes us feel less like a family and more like fractioned off groups that don't trust each other. Interesting. Yeah. Oh my God. We how how much time do we have here? <laughs> how much time do we have here? I don't know. No, I mean, I, have I taken up a lot of time? No. I, I what I'm saying is if we could do this all night, how how many more drinks do you have over there? We could do oh, this all God. night. Oh, honey, you know me. I'm not, look. I have another drink. I'm never at a loss for a drink. <laughs> well, perfect. well, perfect. I mean, you you really um, hit on something really interesting as far as. Um, lesbian somewhat, you know, kind of being a second thought. And and I want to make sure that we're very clear that we are talking about lesbians in this context. We understand absolutely uh, the struggles of trans women, trans oh, women. Of course across. we do. Right. And, I, and I'm saying that just for this people who where, are watching. Yeah, you know, these are two uh, separate and, and issues. This is where we get into trouble. This is what I'm right. like, A does not equal B. And when I, I live <laughs> right. for correctness, that's what I mean about the fighting of political correctness. Saying that about lesbians does not negate the struggles of trans women. It does not. Or trans men. It does not. I'm merely pointing out a fact within our own community that we might want to we might want to work on. It's called sexism, kids, and it exists. We know it exists, and it exists very much within the queer community. Yeah, and you nailed it. And I know, I know what you meant. I just know that you know, different people take you know watching might might think it's something else. But these are two separate issues. And absolutely, um, I, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and it's happening within our own community, not just mainstream. Uh, and we're it's not always that. Yeah. You know, the thing about the queer community is we're a microcosm of society around us. Unfortunately, mm. I yep. wish we weren't. 
but we are because we're people. Yeah, we're people. So of course we are. So within our 10% of society community, we're going to have the same sort of problems that society does, you know, yep. and it's what we, what we should be woke about within this community is to try to get past those things, to work on that every day of our lives. You know, every second I'm alive, I work on being a better person. Yeah, I like that. Now there's a lot of people out there that's going to say, what? It's like, I do. I work on it. I'm a white person, and I, I that right there comes with that. I'm a white person. So I know that I have been treated a specific way that other people mm -hmm. who are not white have not been treated, even though I look like this. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I know that, right? So every day I check my privilege on that. Every day. And, so, and I've made comments out loud about it in situations. Yeah. Now, Is that wrong with I'm that? Like, Excuse me, but that black woman was standing right in front of me. Why are you turning to me first? Good for you. I know goddamn well why they were turning to me first, but I'm not going to let them get away with it. No. That's, well, that's what allyship looks like. I said, exactly. Period. And, and it takes you know, practice. It, I say this all the time. Allyship takes practice. You're not going to be perfect overnight. You just, oh, my like, God, no. And you know, I'm 63 like, years old. I'm 63 <laughs> years old. I've been working on this my whole life. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, it's it's ongoing work. It's absolutely ongoing work. And um, none of it will ever be second nature, you know? Second yeah. nature is pretty much to do what society has raised you to do. So you always have to just say fuck you to society and do the right thing. Yep, agreed. Agreed. Thank what you. What a great movie. That's I feel like that uh that needs to be a takeaway. Just that line <laughs> alone on this. Just that line alone. Um I saw the question before and I don't know where it is, but somebody wanted to know cuz I want to respect your time here. Um uh what you, you've been doing I for prom. I got nothing to do with you. I got nothing to do with you and then I'm going to watch the Yankees game. So I'm done. Gonna Perfect. Well, so, somebody wanted to know, what have you been doing for Pride Month? Any Pride celebrations or, I mean, New uh, York Pride? Well, I, I to, oh, my God. Well, I'm, a, I'm in a movie called Holy Irresistible. It's a new movie. It's literally filming as we speak. So uh, last week, I'm playing a really fun character named Aunt Brad. It's, uh, for me, the role of a lifetime. I'm very excited about this movie. I'm very excited about this role. So uh, they did what we call in our business, shot me out. I have a really big part, but I only had a week because I was doing oh. other things. Yeah. So they brought me in. I was there for six days, night shoots, which means we started, like the first day I was there, I started at two in the afternoon. I got off at midnight or something a little bit later. And it just kept getting later and later and later until we got to the Saturday before Gay Pride, which was Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, and my call was at six o'clock in the morning, uh, six o'clock in the evening, I mean. Sorry, five o'clock in the evening. Well, I didn't get off work until three. Um, and my plane was at 5.30 to take me to New York. So I was like, well, should I get a nap or should I just party with the cast and the crew? So I partied with the cast and the crew because <laughs> I'm always going to make that wrong decision. I got on, I got on the, got in the car, got a little nap from, cause I, we were filming in Rome, Georgia. So I got a little nap from Rome to the Atlanta airport, uh, which is by the way, the most horrifying airport ever. It makes LaGuardia <laughs> look like Heathrow. So yeah, could almost miss my flight running around trying to get through security insanity get to my flight. I take a little two hour nap on the flight. I get home at 11 o'clock in the morning. I get to my apartment at noon. I take a shower, <laughs> change my clothes, and then ran to the West Village for pride. <laughs> <laughs> you are committed. Point, oh yeah. At some point it was like 10 o'clock at night or something. And somebody asked me something like, they had to get, I'm tired. I have to get up the next day. And I was like, you're tired. You are 30 years old. I am 63 years old and I have been up for 31 hours. Working nonetheless. 
So that's what I did for gay pride. Wow. So, yeah, I partied. Mo I was at the Cubby Hole and then Henrietta Hudson's. Very cool. Very cool. And then came, came home and had very proud gay sex. <laughs> very proud lesbian sex to celebrate their pride. That's, mo that's most important. That's most important here. <laughs> Ah, now I see what this is what happens when we continue and then we're drinking. <laughs> I love it. Um, speaking of going out, because I want to make sure, because I don't know if people know this or not, but you have an establishment in Provincetown. Yeah. I was like, this is just another reason I need to get my ass over there. Tell hey. us, uh, tell us, yeah, oh tell God, us. You've, never been to Provincetown. you've got to come to P Town. P Town is so much goddamn fun. You will love it. It's just a riot. It's just, it's fun from beginning to end. Yeah. There was this bar called the, the Pied, the Pied in, uh, in P-Town. The Pied, before that was called the Pied Piper, before that was called the Ace of Spades. The Ace of Spades was the first lesbian bar that was opened in New England. Um, and that was in 1950s, mm -hmm. I think, somewhere, maybe 60s. Uh, in 1972 or three or something like that, it bur in that vicinity, it burnt down and they rebuilt it up and it was still the Ace of Spades. Uh, in 1986, it was bought. Um, no, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. In 1980, I think it was bought by Pam Genervino and it was turned into the Pied Piper. And then okay. it was bought by Susan Webster in like 1986, continued to be the Pied Piper. Around mid '90s, she changed it to the Pie, and it stayed there. And it was supposed to be a lesbian bar. However, the lesbians basically stopped going there because the person who owned it was just not a nice person. So nobody mm -hmm. ever wanted to go there. Yeah. <laughs> so she wanted to sell this bar, and um, to me, it had a, like a historical perspective and value, and and was a part of our community. And it was going to be bought by a dispensary, by a marijuana dispensary. And I was like, why would we, this, it, it, it was right on the, it's right on the beach. It has a huge deck and this beautiful view of the bay. Oh, it looks gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It really is gorgeous. Anybody Google the club and you'll see how gorgeous it is. But I was like, oh my God, I can't, I can't let this happen. So my business partner is an ally. His name is uh, Frank Christopher. He and his wife, Emily, in fact, he is one of my dearest friends. They are close, close friends. Um, great allies of our community. The only reason I would be in business with a straight white guy, trust me. Um, <laughs> but he's also just a mensch and a lovely human being and is a huge supporter of us. I became a minister. Like I became a minister. I have a license so that I could marry them on their wedding day, right? Mm. So that, that's how much I love this guy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I went to him because he's opened several businesses. He actually was, um, he's one of the owners of Smoke Jazz and Supper Club here in New York City, where I used to be their brunch show. I, I also used to be their Wednesday night midnight show, which was called Round Midnight Jazz Club. So uh, I went to him and I was like, Frank, this place is for sale. This is what they're asking. Um, it has all the licenses, you know, liquor, entertainment, kitchen, even though it doesn't have a kitchen. What do you think? So we bought it. That was, the, this is now our third season. We renovated the entire place. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's dyke owned business. It is not a lesbian bar. It's, it's a nightclub. It's a, it's a place for, for performances rather than dancing and, you know, stuff like that. The food is ridiculous uh amanda who is our head chef is a badass butch dyke and she's put together this menu that'll just you'll fucking die try the be breakfast pizza if you go there for breakfast try the breakfast pizza got it got it oh breakfast my God. Pizza. <laughs> it's like it's pizza dough and instead of tomato sauce they use she uses a sausage gravy and then eggs and cheese. So it's basically deconstructed biscuits and gravy, you mm. know, served like a pizza. But yeah, so we have all that. And then we have just, the vibe is just a, a really chill, great vibe, vacation vibe. It's not a place, a scene where you go to like 
jump up and down and get crazy drunk and scream. No, it's more like, look at the pretty water, relax, drink, drink a Babs Johnson pink flamingo, uh, which is our signature drink, which is basically a, a froze with made with tequila rather than vodka. We add a little grenadine and then we serve it to you in a pink flamingo floaty and you get to keep the floaty. Oh my God, I wanna be there now. The way that you're <laughs> painting this picture is like torture right now over here. <laughs> We also have the orange is the new black, which is essentially an or orange margarita that they serve straight up in a martini glass with um, black black salt rim. Yeah, you know the yeah. volcano black salt. Yeah, also yeah. So it's an orange is the new black. That's also Very a really cool. fun signature drink. And yeah, and the um, I I am going to start performing there every Thursday night starting July twenty second. So I'll be there from July 22nd, at least through September, depending on work, but possibly all the way till November. All right, I'm going to, I'm I'm coming. Great. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming between July 22nd and November. And my shows are, for, all of our shows are free. My show is free. You do not pay a cover to come into that show. You'll come oh, and you see me perform. You can buy food and you can have drinks, but, um, it's a different kind of vibe. We're not looking for that pay 50 bucks to see a show situation. We're looking for that more like, come on in and have a good time. And yeah, guess what? Here, here, here's Leah Delaria and you're literally getting to see her for free. Oh, I love that. And it's called the club, the club, the club. You all, uh, it's club. Ptown.com is the website to be exact. If anybody wants to come with me between July 22nd and November, please <laughs> join me. Um, I've been wanting to get to P-Town forever, and I and I think you are going to be my excuse, my friend. Every day you show up, and I will show you P-Town because oh, I know P-Town. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm I'm dead serious, so I'm I'm gonna make that happen. I need to treat myself to a nice vacation, uh, Love especially. It. Love it. Yeah, yeah. Stacy williams Iger. Hi, Stacy. She says, P-Town road trip. Let's do it. I'm in, Stacy. Let's go. <laughs> so I want to make sure that everyone knows about this indie film you have going on as well before you leave. You have been a busy, busy person. Um, so in addition um, to the film you were talking about, um, filming during Pride, right. you also have this indie film, uh, Potato Dreams of America. Tell yeah. us about that. Oh, this, this is a very quirky little indie that I love. This is one of the times I get to play a straight person, which is very exciting. Uh, the movie is written and directed and edited by Wes Hurley. Um, it is the story of his life. It is a true story. Wes uh, grew up in Russia. He was born in Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. under communism and was there when perestroika happened. Uh, and, and he and his mother immigrated to Seattle. So this is the story of their life. So the beginning of the movie is his life in Ru Russia as a young gay kid and the kind of homophobic environment that he lived in mm. and the kind of economic depression that they lived in. And, um, it's shot, I don't know how to put this, it's incredibly surreal, the way, the way it is shot. And when it's in Russia, it's very dark and moody and, you know, like Russia. I play his grandmother, who is a very, very strong, very strong influence and woman in his life, a very big part of his life. And uh, she, she's, uh, <laughs> she's a pistol. <laughs> She hates everything. So <laughs> she's, she hates everything. Nothing's ever good enough for her. She's very upset by the downfall of communism. There's like, yeah, there's all, it's like boom, 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 boom. It's all this stuff with her. Um, but uh, they then immigrate to America. And I don't wanna, it's a true story and you're gonna be so shocked by it. Like when I read the script, I went, Oh, come on, that can't be. You know, when I read what the real big twist is that I don't want to tell anybody. Yeah, don't tell us. And yeah, I'm not going to tell you. But I did, I did, you know, call the office and went, 
this, this is a fact. This is the truth. And they were like, yeah. And believe me, at the end of the movie, they show the people involved. They show the, the actors. And some of them are Dan Loria, for example, is very well known. I'm well known. There's some, some of us are well known. And it shows us next to the real pictures the of real the real people. people. You know, oh, I love when they do that at the end of films. Oh, my God. And yeah, yeah. And um, I had probably the most amazing compliment of my life that came when this, this, the, the movie has done incredibly well. It's made all the film festivals. Uh, in fact, it'll be at Outfest next, next oh. August. Um, so I'll be there. If anybody, I'll be there for the Q and A afterwards, and you know the carpet and all of that. Uh, but we have been picked up for distribution by Black Cloud is the name of the company. So we will. It's a theatrical release. We are not going to scream. We're going to do a theatrical release, which I think is fitting for this particular movie because it is a really great little movie. John Waters came to see the movie at the Provincetown Film Festival, and he loved it. He loved it. He stayed for the Q&A, which he, he, I'm going to tell you, John doesn't do it unless he likes the movie. So when I saw that he was staying for the movie, I was really excited. I talked, to, I spoke to him before the movie. We have talked about the Divine documentary, a couple other things. I was two rows behind him. And then I walked up, you know, at the end of the movie, everyone's applauding the way it is. In a, and I walked up to the front of the movie theater and uh, they said, you know, now it's time for the Q&A. And John immediately shot his hand up and he took his mask off and he said, I just want to say that this is for Leah. I have to tell you that I had no idea it was you until the credit roll. Wow. He was talking to me. I was two rows behind him. Because I had no idea. I spent the whole movie going, I know that actress. She's so familiar. <laughs> but I didn't realize it was you until the credit roll. You entirely disappeared into that character. So that's a, for an actor, that's the biggest fucking compliment. Yeah, it had. is. And I got it from John Waters. So I just want to say to everybody, apparently my work is really good in this film. Oh, I'm excited to see this. And I know we can go to uh, uh, the it's website. Such a, it's such a great little movie. It deserves, it's like the little train that could. Yeah. You know, she has just, I think I can, I know I can, all the way to the top of the hill. It looks really good. So please see this movie. Oh, I love it. If everyone, you guys can go to potatodreamfilm.com uh, yeah. to get more information. And, and I'm assuming where we can see it, like Outfest. Uh, and then yeah. it got picked up, which is amazing. It's so picked up. So it's going to be, it'll be distribution this summer. I, I'm sure, I'm sorry, probably this fall after it does the festival circuit. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're, we're looking forward to seeing it and supporting anything uh, that you are in. And we just, we appreciate um, just again, just being, as you say, a daikon, a, a pioneer uh, and being visible and being visible. I'm going to hear this joke until the day I die. I love you. Yeah, you will. Um, we might be making a tag shirt out of it. So uh, <laughs> look out for that. <laughs> Got to get your signature for your face and <laughs> likeness. <laughs> But no, seriously, thank you for, you know, uh, everything you've done uh, with paving the way for uh, not like, and like you said, when you were explaining Orange is the New Black, not just butch, you know, women, but women in yeah. general uh, and giving people uh, that look like us a, a face, you know, and visibility. It's so important. It's so important for a young butch child to, to see someone that looks like them on screen. Uh, there's Spend nothing. My whole career. It's exactly why I do what I do. I would say my my career has been about don't judge a butch by its cover. And, <laughs> yeah, and I've said that for years. I know that when I was a little kid, I didn't see anybody like me on TV. Or yeah. Anything. So no. I'm very, very, very happy and proud to be that person that people look at now. It's and more coming. More and more coming all the time. Say that again. Say that again, my friend. More, more coming all the time. And man, let's get let's get some goddamn POC out there. I'm fucking done with that shit too. You don't even want to hear me go off on this. <laughs> me, you and me both. <laughs> oh, honey, I'm done. I'm fucking done with it. You yeah. and me both. But I, you are so appreciated. I can't say that enough. And and you were the perfect person to to kick this season off with us. And uh, just 
thank you. Thank you so much. And to everyone who's watching out there, thanks for tuning in. Share this, um, you know, with friends. We'll be back next month with a special guest, um, an actress from the new Gossip Girl. And if you want to find out who, you got to stay connected with Tag Magazine on Facebook. Or go to our website, tagmagazine.com slash and scene, and you'll just have to stay connected with us. And uh, I guess I'll have to leave uh, Leah hanging too. Uh, maybe oh, that's how. No. <laughs> but I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, everyone who's out there watching. If nobody has told you today, remember that you are loved and seen. See you guys. <laughs>